I would invite you this morning to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4, where we will continue our discovery in this book. What grabs your attention? What gets your attention and holds it? Car accident happening in front of you? Maybe a tsunami or some natural disaster caught on camera and you just watch the devastation piece by piece. Maybe the play-by-play reporting of a lost submersible or the unfolding details of some political scandal. What holds your attention? What holds the attention of a large crowd? Maybe a really good concert where a whole mass of people is gripped by the movement of music, the sounds and the sights, the emotions stirred all in unison, everyone present drawn together in a symphonic chorus of appreciation and wonder. The audience participates together in a harmonic experience of awe. Or maybe you've been to a sellout, crowded game during the playoffs. All eyes are glued on every detail of every play and a hundred thousand voices simultaneously, spontaneously erupt in praise at a pivotal turn of events. I want to turn your attention this morning to the pivotal event in world history. The culmination of redemptive history, the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, the apex of God's plan to sum up all things in Christ, to vindicate His holiness, to manifest His glory in all the earth, and to receive due praise from every created thing. That's what we will see in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. And it is impossible to overstate the importance of the event that we will observe in this passage This is what the timeline of events in the universe have been inexorably pressing toward ever since the world was founded. I'll give you a heading for all that we'll see here in these two chapters. It is the throne room scene. And this throne room scene in Revelation 4 and 5 depicts the culmination of history in the universal recognition of the glory of God. Everyone, everywhere will acknowledge God as God. They will see His glory manifest. This is where all of history is running. And we get a window into this in our Bibles in these two chapters. Look down at your Bibles. We're going to read chapters 4 and 5 in their entirety and enter with John into this scene. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven... And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. There was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance." Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third had the face of a man, the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, full of eyes around and within, day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, To him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. 
I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. I have now an impossible undertaking. For me to understand the gravity of this scene and to attempt to communicate it. I don't know whether to yell it all out for emphasis or to sing it through or to remain silent before it. And you have an impossible task to grapple with the gravity of this scene. It's as if the burden this morning is for me to pick up the Himalaya mountain range and to set it on your lap and say, here, hold this. These are things we cannot do and yet we must try this morning. Chapter 4 details worship as the fundamental obligation of everything created. Everything must worship God simply by right of creation. It is the universal obligation of everything made to praise the Maker. And in chapter 5, we discover that worship becomes the unique privilege of the redeemed. Of course, the elect heavenly beings who never sinned, but a countless mass of humanity who have sinned and have been purchased out by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed so that they may worship too. And we see concentric circles of worship, and this worship is appropriate. It is inexorable. It is inevitable. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And these concentric circles of worship, demanded by right of creation and purchased by the blood of the Lamb for the redeemed, will be the task of everyone, even as it is the task of heaven. The scene that we see here in Revelation 4 and 5 depicts the great pivot of history. It is an event where the tides change where rebellion sees its end and God's glory fills the earth. We see the glory of God in judgment and the glory of God in redemption. And this scene will take us from the throne of God to the cross of Christ, to the eternity of worship for all those who belong to Him. I'm going to give you the outline for today and next week up on the screen 
uh, will attempt three things. I want to locate this scene for us in the book of Revelation and then locate this scene for us in the whole plan of redemption and the whole scope of history. And then we'll unfold the details of Revelation chapter 4, the first half of this scene. Uh, We will likely get to the details of chapter 4 next week, Lord willing. Let's begin this morning by locating this throne room scene in the book of Revelation. Uh, Turn in the book of Revelation back to chapter 1. And you remember that chapter 1, verse 19, gives us a very helpful outline for the entirety of the book. There, Jesus commands John the Revelator, the apostle, to write, The things you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. The things which John saw refers to chapter 1 in the glorified vision of Christ. The things which are, that which was contemporary in John's day, were the state of the churches, those seven churches we looked at in the letters from Jesus through John to the churches in Asia Minor in the first century. That was chapters 2 and 3. And then he says, you're going to write the things which shall be after these things. And that gives us a heading for all the rest of the book of Revelation, from chapter 4 all the way through chapter 22. Notice verse 1 of chapter 4. John begins by saying, after these things, I looked. This is a a technical, grammatical marker for John that we have moved on to the next section. This is the future. And notice what John says there, that these are things that must take place. Come up here, Jesus says to him, I will show you what must take place. The events that unfold in the book of Revelation are absolutely necessary. They are inevitable. They are in the plan of God. This is where history must go. History has no choice but to culminate in the scenes we are about to see. And notice secondly in verse 1, Jesus says, you must see the things that must take place after these things. After these things. That is, after the church is gone, the church disappears from the book of Revelation for the next 15 chapters during this tribulation period, the seals, trumpets, and bowls judgment, Daniel's 70th week. The the church is not present. And after the church era, these things are what must take place. So immediately from chapter 4, verse 1, we are in the future. That which is future from John's perspective, that which is still future from our own perspective. Now let's unfold the outline for the rest of the book of Revelation. I have this for you up on the screen. I also have this on the, the notes that are available on the web. Chapters 4 and 5 give us the coronation scene of the coming king, where Jesus will receive the title deed to the earth and the dominion over all peoples, and heaven worships Christ for this. Chapters 6 through 18 take us through the judgment of the earth from heaven. After the king is inaugurated, The king will then judge the earth with heavenly judgments in rapid succession over a period of seven years. What unfolds there is sort of the uncreation of the earth. A lot of things happen in reverse order of the creation week, and God undoes what he made in judgment of the earth dwellers. There is also the unleashing of satanic power. Satan is allowed a longer leash by God to inflict worldwide trouble. There is also the untethering of human potential. You wanna see all that man can be? You wanna see man rise to the greatest heights of his capabilities? You will see depravity unleashed during this period, the period that Jesus calls the worst period of human history, where man will come together in total rebellion against God. We will see there the judgment of the nations, the finishing of gospel proclamation, trouble for Israel, and then a pruning and a regenerating of the nation of Israel, resulting in a new exodus from the four corners of the earth to the land of promise. That takes us to Revelation chapter 19. That is the return of the king to the earth. This time not as a baby or a suffering servant, but a triumphant warrior king who will decimate his rebellious subjects, who will incarcerate the great serpent, and who will execute the beast and the false prophet. That leads to chapter 20. The glorious reign of Messiah King on the earth. A thousand years of Edenic bliss and world peace under the perfect government of God's Messiah. It is kingdom come. 
It is kingdom of heaven down to earth. It is the answer to the disciples' prayer, prayed now by the followers of Christ these past 2,000 years. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. This will be followed by a final demonstration of the end of all rebellion and a final judgment, that awful great white throne judgment at the end of Revelation 20. That leads into Revelation 21 and 22, the the final section, the new heavens and the new earth, where the kingdom of Messiah continues into the eternal age of a new sin-free universe. This throne room scene of Revelation 4 and 5 is a future event that marks the initiation of these final events of the present age, the ushering in of a new era, the glorious era of the manifest reign of the King of all kings. The scene has heaven's attention. Every living being in concentric circles around the throne of God is gripped in rapt attention. Every eye is drawn to the scene where the Ancient of Days gives to His Son the title deed of the earth, It is the go-ahead to judge the nations, the green light to usher in the culmination of world history. Five songs are sung in this scene. The songs of the inner circle around the throne expand to the ends of creation, all in praise of the Lamb slain, the one in whom all the promises of God meet, the one in whom is God's great yes, Messiah King Jesus. Four living beings, 24 elders, myriads and myriads of angels, and all created things everywhere. They all must acknowledge the glory and power and worth of the Son of God. This is the scene that initiates God's reconciling all things to Himself through Christ. Things in heaven and on earth, every power, every person, all the redeemed, and every enemy will all be compelled to give glory to Christ. What happens after this scene? In the book of Revelation, what immediately follows the throne room coronation is a series of worldwide cataclysmic judgments from heaven that prepare the way for the return of the king to the earth, which will usher in the end of this age and the dawn of a totally new way in the universe. Secondly, if we're keeping an outline this morning, let's locate this throne room scene in history. Where does this fit in God's redemptive plan? How does this hit all the rest of the Bible? I think what we'll look at next will help us see how the whole Bible fits together. You remember that your Bible is one book with one capital A author, God wrote the Bible. Because God wrote it, it it has the integrity of his nature, it has the continuity of his plan. We should expect it to fit together. Your Bible is also 66 books with many human authors, several languages over a couple millennia. But all of it is going in the same direction. And the details of God's plan are unfolded over time. What should we expect from the last book of our Bible? To pull all of God's revelation together, what got unraveled in Genesis at the entrance of evil, the fall of man into sin, and the curse of God of the universe gets re-raveled in the book of Revelation. All the scattered threads of storylines in the Bible all find their way back together into one rope in the book of Revelation. In one sense, the book of Revelation does not give us a new story, but fills in many details and weaves together all of those other stories the Bible has been revealing all along. Remember that your Bible is made up of details and your Bible is made up of grand sweeping storylines. And we want both. We want the details and we want the big picture. The big picture is made of the pixels. You can't neglect the details or you mess up the big picture. And you can't miss the big picture or you will not have the pixels in their right place. We want to understand what God has communicated. A reminder about the book of Revelation, there are no direct quotes in the book of Revelation. And yet the influence of the rest of the Bible in the book of Revelation means that there are thousands of references to other scriptures. The vocabulary, the phraseology, and the imagery, the themes, the theology, all of it comes from all of the rest of the Bible. 
Every paragraph in the book of Revelation, more than any other book of your Bible, is filled with the vocabulary, the phrases, and the images of the rest of Scripture. And in particular, chapters four and five, this throne room scene we're looking at for the next few weeks is chock full of images, chock full of vocabulary, phraseology from others who saw the Lord, high and exalted. The prophets Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel in particular, their language, their imagery, their vocabulary shows up in this section. And even some of the vocabulary of the Apostle Paul who saw the risen Christ in the New Testament. I believe there are multiple visions of Christ at the throne room that parallel one another in Scripture. And I want us to see this together. We'll look particularly at Daniel, Ezekiel, and Isaiah this morning. I believe these three prophets got to see the same event that John describes here in Revelation 4 and 5. Daniel, Isaiah, and Ezekiel all got to see the coronation of Messiah King in the throne room of heaven. They were all transported to this future event to see the same things we're looking at here this morning. We'll work our way backwards. Let's start with the prophet Daniel. Turn to Daniel chapter 7. And if you missed working through Daniel verse by verse uh, on our Sunday nights, I would encourage you to perhaps go back to Daniel chapter 7 and get some more of the details. We'll fly through this vision. Beginning in verse 9, Daniel writes, I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. Myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, the books were opened. I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to that one was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This is a a picture, I believe, of the same event. We have here the Son of Man approaching the throne of the Ancient of Days, look again at verse 14, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. This one was given that which belongs properly only to God. This coronation scene, according to Daniel, was in the distant future. This didn't happen in Daniel's day. This was something he was seeing in a prophetic vision, ushered into the throne room of heaven to see across time and space that which had not yet taken place. You remember back to Daniel chapter 2 and the the vision and the dream of Nebuchadnezzar that God gave the explanation to Daniel. There was a statue of metals and that statue detailed four kingdoms. And Daniel prophesied during that first kingdom described, the Babylonian Empire. It was followed by the Medo-Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans and then the mixed metal and clay of Rome 2.0 that is still yet to come. In Daniel 2, 28 and 29, Daniel uses two really interesting phrases. He says, in the last days, and he says, after these things. In the Greek text, it's exactly the same as Revelation 4 Verse 1, the after these things I saw. John is intentionally pointing us to the same event. This is the end of the times of the Gentiles. It's the end of both sections of the Roman Empire, the Rome that crucified Messiah and the revived Rome that will constitute the world empire of the Antichrist. You remember in Daniel 2 that the stone made without hands comes down out of heaven and displaces every human government. 
It ends the reign of sinful man on the earth, and it stalls, installs forever the kingdom of God. And do you remember that stone out of heaven strikes the statue, not at the head of gold, not during the Babylonian Empire, not during the Medo-Persian Empire, not during the Greek Empire, not during the Roman Empire at the time of the crucifixion of Messiah. But at Rome 2.0, at the end of the age, the, the stone from heaven smacks the feet and obliterates the entire statue of who human governance to chaff, which blows away in the wind and never comes back. And that mountain fills the earth. This is the kingdom of God and his Christ filling the earth with God's glory and his righteousness. Turn to Daniel chapter 12. This follows right after the pre-incarnate Christ comes to Daniel and speaks to him about the details of the last little period of human history right before that kingdom comes. And Daniel says in verse 8, As for me, I heard, but I could not understand. I said, My Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Jesus describes to Daniel in this prophetic revelation what will happen at the end time, the same exact events that the prophet John details for us in the book of Revelation. And to Daniel, Jesus says, these are sealed up, Daniel, for the end time. What would happen next? Daniel lived during the Babylonian Empire. World empires would come and go. The saints would be mistreated and persecuted. God is still sovereign, but the kingdom will not yet come. Many prophetic events have to happen before that comes. Now consider the difference in Revelation 22. John the prophet receiving Jesus' revelation about the same events. And listen to these instructions. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, John, for the time is near. Same wording as to Daniel, just the opposite command. What's the difference? For Daniel, these events were far away. For John, they are imminent. Daniel and John see the same scene. At the end of this age, the installment, the enthronement, the coronation of Christ at the throne of God. But for Daniel, there were intervening events, intervening kingdoms. What prophetic events do we await before the unfolding of the events of the book of Revelation? None. Uh, there are no promises of Scripture that, that we are waiting for before this coronation event. All of the departure of the church, the coronation of Christ, the worst period in human history, Daniel's 70th week, and the coming of Christ in his kingdom will all happen in one era. Daniel 7 occurs in the middle of that book, and it becomes the central reality of the whole of Daniel's life and prophetic ministry. In fact, if you think about the message of the book of Daniel, it is, it is simply this, God's saints, God's holy ones in the earth will be mistreated and they will be glorified. They will be mistreated, they will be persecuted, they will suffer hardship under sinful human governance. And you remember Daniel was part of the faithful remnant that was exiled out of Jerusalem, living in a foreign land, a land of pagan idolatry and enmity towards the God of Israel. But the promise is that Messiah's kingdom would one day arrive, obliterate all hostility, rescue the saints, fulfill God's promises to Israel, and make God's kingdom the kingdom of every nation on the earth. That was the message of the book of Daniel. And it's interesting that Daniel's own life was something of a, a smaller version, a microcosm of his message. He himself was personally persecuted, mistreated. And yet God repetitively honored Daniel, brought him glory, fame, notoriety. It's as if his own life as the prophet encapsulated the message of his prophecy, which was all based on this central theme that Messiah would come one day and fill the earth with his kingdom. 
Abner Chow, in his book titled, I Saw the Lord, A Biblical Theology of Vision, makes a compelling case that the prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah witnessed the same event that Daniel describes, that John details for us in Revelation. Let's work our way back to the prophet Ezekiel. What do we find there? We, we see a series of visions in Ezekiel, three in particular, that take us back to this throne room scene of God. They, they are chapters 1 to 3, chapters 8 to 11, and then chapters 40 to 43. These become the major divisions in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a contemporary of Daniel, part of the Babylonian captivity. He is prophesying of God's future realities from enemy territory, and there's not much hope. Only pagan oppression, exiled from the land of promise, away from the temple of Yahweh, which had been decimated and destroyed and left in ruins. We won't look at all of Ezekiel's vision scenes here, but turn your attention to Ezekiel chapter 1. The prophet writes, It came about in the 30th year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, I was by the river Chebar among the exiles, and the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Verse 4, as I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually, a bright light around it, and in its midst, something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it were figures resembling four living beings. This was their appearance. They had human form. Each had four faces and four wings, straight legs like a calf's hoof for their feet. They gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, were human hands. As for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right, the bull on the left, the eagle on, uh, and the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching another being and two covered their bodies. Each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright. The lightning was flashing from the fire. And the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. As I looked at the living beings, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living beings for each of the four of them. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling barrel. All four of them had the same form, their appearance and workmanship being as if one wheel were within another. And whenever they moved, they moved in any of their four directions without turning as they moved. For as for their rims, they were lofty and awesome, and the rims of all four of them were full of eyes round about. And whenever the living beings moved, the wheels moved with them. And whenever the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction. And the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Whenever those went, these went. Whenever those stood still, these stood still. And whenever those rose from the earth, the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels." Now over the heads of the living beings was something like an expanse, an awesome gleam of crystal spread out over their heads. Under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, one to another. Each one had two wings covering the body, one side and the other. I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of abundant waters as they went, like the voice of the Almighty, the sound of tumult, like the sound of an army camp. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. And there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads, The expanse was something like resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli in appearance. And on that which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upwards something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire. And there was a radiance around him. As the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Yahweh. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. We see in Ezekiel's vision, and this unfolds again in chapter 10 and then in several other places in the book, a chariot throne. The the chariot throne of God depicting the presence of God and his glory in the heavenly temple. 
And Ezekiel describes the scenes and the successive visions with the vocabulary of a temple. And this glorious presence of God is not confined to, to one place. It moves where God wishes. In fact, one day, according to Ezekiel 43, that glorious presence will come to a new temple in Jerusalem, to a renewed Israel, to be the centerpiece of God's glory, filling the whole earth. What is the message of Ezekiel's book, his prophecy? It revolves around this idea of temple and the chariot throne as the very presence of God. Where will God dwell? Ezekiel is all about this dwelling presence of God. And, and there are three categories throughout the book where the uh, glory of God is said to dwell. In the human heart, in a physical temple, and filling the whole earth, all peoples and nations. And the problem in the book of Ezekiel is that the human heart is hard like stone. It is full of idolatry and adultery, and the people are spiritually dead. And the problem with the physical temple in Israel is that it was polluted by harlotry and idolatry, and in Ezekiel's day was abandoned and decimated. And then the problem with the earth is that the humanity of the whole earth is joined in rebellion against God. God's glorious presence if it comes to a world full of people with no spiritual life, is not good news. Humanity in his rebellion, when that humanity meets God in his glory, will only result in judgment. And the solution Ezekiel presents is a solution on all three planes. First of all, the human heart. In Ezekiel 36, we get the promise in the new covenant for Israel of a new heart. This is the fundamental solution to humanity's fundamental problem. That a hard heart is melted by the Spirit of God and made soft. A heart of stone turned to a heart of flesh. In Ezekiel 37, we see the human problem solved in another picture. You have there the valley of dry bones, a field of corpses. The problem with the people of Israel is, spiritually speaking, they were dead. And they were incapable of anything pleasing to the Lord. They, they couldn't fix their own dilemma being dead. What is the solution? That God, by the Holy Spirit, would breathe life into this valley of dry bones. There's a solution also for the physical temple. That which had been defiled, polluted. In Ezekiel 40, verse 2 God promises that Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the, the place of his dwelling on the earth, would become high and lifted up. In Ezekiel 40 to 48, Ezekiel describes a new temple, a purified temple, amidst a purified people with God's glory filling it, Ezekiel 43. And then for the earth, according to Ezekiel 38, 23, and 39, 21 and following, the glory of God would extend to all the nations of the earth and would thereby fill the earth. The nations would be brought into obedience. How will God accomplish all of these things? In Daniel, we learned that God would accomplish the problem of human kingdoms by bringing his own kingdom to the earth and smashing them all. How will God solve the problem of hard hearts, polluted temples, and rebellious earth? Look at Ezekiel 37, beginning in verse 21. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, I will gather them from every side, bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king will be king for all of them. They will no longer be two nations. They will no longer be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols or with their detestable things or with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all of their dwelling places in which they've sinned, and I will cleanse them, and they will be my people, and I will be their God." My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. They will walk in my ordinances. They will keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived. They will live on it and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. 
And I will make a covenant of peace with them, an everlasting covenant. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. God will bring about the solution to Israel's problems with the coming of the new David, the servant shepherd king over Israel, Messiah. We see Ezekiel's message, which springs out of his vision, encapsulated in his life. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2. Right after that amazing vision of the throne room scene with the chariot throne moving about at the behest of the Spirit of God, we read this. Then he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. As he spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. What had happened in the verse previously? Ezekiel had fallen down on his face before the Lord, before the glory of the Lord, as a dead man. What happens to him? The Spirit enters him and he stands. This is a pre-echo of exactly what God would do with the nation of Israel. They are a field of corpses and the Holy Spirit will enter them, breathe life into them, and give them life so that they may obey. Ezekiel couldn't even obey the, the Lord's command to listen without the Spirit entering him and getting him up on his feet. Let's turn to Isaiah. I believe that Abner Chow is right in seeing Isaiah chapter 6 as another angle on the same scene we've been detailing. In Revelation 4 and 5, Daniel chapter 7, and Ezekiel chapter 1. Read the first three verses with me. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord, Edonai, sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the hem of his robe filling the temple, and seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Notice verse 3. Glory fills the earth. I've preached Isaiah 6 a number of times, and and in my mind I've had trouble with verse 3. What do you mean his glory fills the earth? Not yet, right? Maybe Isaiah means that in the sense of like Psalm 19, the the heavens are telling of the glory of God. But rebellious humanity doesn't recognize the glory of God. His glory is not manifest in such a way like when Isaiah came in contact with it, he fell down. Ezekiel saw God's glory and he fell down. The disciples saw Jesus glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration and they were bewildered. And John fell on his face in in Revelation chapter 1. That glory is not filling the earth yet. And yet Isaiah 6.3 says that the glory of Yahweh fills the earth. And we ought to have been asking the question, when? And I think the when question gets answered if this text is giving another angle for us on the same scene as Revelation 4 and 5. The coronation of Messiah when the keys are handed over to Jesus the Christ and the glory of Yahweh will fill the earth because the king will come and bring heaven and the glory of God manifest to the earth for all to see. It's an interesting detail I have overlooked. What is the book of Isaiah about? It's about judgment and salvation. It's about the glory of God as king in judging sinners and in saving sinners. In the first five chapters, you get the impurity and hypocrisy of God's people Israel. They are filthy. They are separated from God by their sin. They are arrogant. And interesting language is used to describe their attitude. They are lofty in their own minds. They are lifted up and exalted by their actions and their attitudes. You come to chapter six and we read, Edonai, the Lord, the master of all things, he is high and lifted up. Higher than King Uzziah, 
higher than the kings and empires of the earth, higher than religious hypocrites. He is high and lifted up. This is his glory in heaven. But it has not yet filled the earth. The people are defiled, separated from God, and filthy. God must bring low the proud. He must clean the filthy if his glorious presence is to dwell among them and they not be destroyed. You remember Sennacherib in Isaiah 37, that that pagan king who had to skulk with his tail between his legs in defeat away from Israel. God turned him around when his armies were clearly uh, able to defeat Israel's armies. God stopped him in his tracks, humbled him, and killed him in front of his own idol back home. Throughout the book of Isaiah, you have this play on words between that which is high and that which is low, that which is exalted in its own mind versus the exaltation of the glory of God. In Isaiah 40 to 48, we find that God is peerless and he is jealous for his own glory and he will have no rivals. In Isaiah 59, we discover that God's people are filthy with blood on their hands and it is not that God is impotent that Israel is in trouble, it is that their sins have separated them from their God. Isaiah 64 tells us that even their best deeds are filthy. And yet Isaiah 60 verse 14 tells us that Zion will be a place for all peoples, all the nations. Isaiah 11 tells us there will be a a time of world peace that encompasses every people on the earth. They will beat their swords into plowshares. Even in the animal world, animal predation will cease. And carnivores will eat salad. An entire different order is coming. How does this all happen? God says in Isaiah 66 too that the one he will look to is the one who is humble, contrite of spirit, and who trembles at his word. How does that all come about from a a world of haughty, arrogant, high, and lifted up people in their own minds? Self-righteous and filthy. How will God accomplish this? How will the filth be cleaned? How will God's glory fill the earth? This leads to Isaiah's message. We discover in Isaiah 7 that a child will be virgin born. In Isaiah 9 that that child will be God in person and he will rule the world. It will be the end of rebellion and pride and the reign of righteousness on the earth. And of course in Isaiah 53, and you can turn there, we discover that this child who will rule the earth, who is God in the flesh, will be a suffering servant. Who believed that message? Verse 3, despised, forsaken of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He would be like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, Israel will sing, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and afflicted. He didn't open his mouth like a lamb led to slaughter. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for his generation, when all of this happened, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? Verse 10, Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting in grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, prolong his days, and the good pleasure of Yahweh would prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many and bear their iniquities. Therefore, his allotment will be a portion with the great. He'll divide the plunder with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, he bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. That child 
would come to cleanse the filth. And this same one, this suffering servant, will bring low the haughty of mind. Those who are high and exalted in their own hearts. In this same servant song, which really begins in chapter 52, look at verse 13. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Same exact language as Isaiah 6, 1. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw Adonai high and exalted. Here in 52, 13, the servant will be high and exalted. What does this mean? Jesus the Christ will be given that which is due only God. Dominion, authority, power, rule, exaltation, He is the one who receives glory, who in Revelation 4 and 5 rightly receives worship. To him is ascribed the work of creation and the work of redemption. He is God, the Son, the sacrificial lamb, the servant king. Think about Isaiah's own life, his own prophetic call at that throne room scene as a microcosm of his prophetic ministry. He experienced the awful presence of the glory of God as a sinner, yet he received purification of his filthy lips by a burning coal from the altar. Now, as we think about these various scenes, I believe these can be harmonized. Revelation 4 and 5, Daniel 7, Ezekiel 1, Isaiah 6. Maybe similar to the way we think about gospel narratives, The gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were multiple witnesses to the same event, and yet they emphasize different details. One gospel writer reports that Jesus healed two demon-possessed men. Another gospel writer focuses our attention on one man. They don't disagree, but they have different emphases in keeping with the message that each writer is trying to convey. And in all of this, the Holy Spirit superintends each human author to convey without error God's perfect word. These visions can harmonize because each of these prophets was ushered supernaturally across time and space into the same future event. Now John in Revelation gets a fuller view than Daniel, Ezekiel, or Isaiah, and we should expect that given the way God has progressed what he has revealed. What did we find in Daniel? A throne, wheels on the throne, multiple thrones around the throne, the Son of Man approaching the throne, the giving of dominion to the Son of Man, the glory of God filling the earth, the Son of Man amongst every people and nation. In Ezekiel, we discovered a throne, wheels, coals of fire, that chariot throne described in temple and altar language, the glory of God filling the earth, and then Messiah, the new David, the shepherd of the new covenant, making possible God's presence in his regenerated people. Four living beings, cherubim, Ezekiel calls them. Four faces, four sides, four wings, four directions, eyes all over. They mirror the movements of the Spirit of God, all in this crystal expanse under the throne. And there is an emerald rainbow. In Isaiah, we discover the temple, the altar, the throne, the coals of fire, the holy, holy, holy anthem of the seraphim, those fiery ones. That is Isaiah's description of the four living beings. And in John's vision, we see the throne, multiple thrones around, the crystal expanse, the four living beings, the fire, Ezekiel's four faces, Isaiah's six wings, the eyes, the holy, holy, holy song, the Spirit of God manifest as torches of fire, the temple, the altar, Jesus approaching the throne, receiving dominion and glory and worship. And then, of course, what follows this is the exercise of his reign as rightful heir to the earth and king of all kings. When we come to John's vision, we we discover the conflagration and the, the amalgamation of all of these visions. How does John's central vision relate to the whole? This throne room coronation of Christ kicks off all the final events that he details in the rest of the book. And what is John's message? The time is near. The time is near. An argument can be made, and Abner Chow 
hints at this in his book that perhaps Paul on the Damascus Road in his vision of the glorified Christ saw the same thing. It is possible that Stephen, as he is being stoned and dying, sees into a window of heaven the exalted Christ. Perhaps they see the same scene. The bottom line in all of these visions is that Jesus is the answer to the world's problems, to man's problems, man's problems of separation from God, man's problems of filth and a hard heart and a broken and cursed world. How do we go from filthy to clean? By by the substitutionary sacrifice of the servant in Isaiah. How does the glory of God fill the earth according to Isaiah? The same servant. How do we go from spiritually dead to spiritually alive? By the servant shepherd king of Ezekiel 37 who gives his Holy Spirit to breathe life into corpses. And how does the glory of God fill the earth? The same servant shepherd king will reign on the earth so that the glory of God will be present in Jerusalem and in a temple and in people's hearts to all the nations. How do God's people go from persecuted to glorified? Daniel's son of man receives the dominion from the ancient of days and ushers in God's glorious kingdom. And how will the glory of God fill the earth? Same answer. The answer is Jesus. And in the language of Paul, we we might see how all of these things bring us to the point where we say all things are summed up in Christ. This is God's plan. Listen to the wording of Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 13. He rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. The Son of God's love is the heir to this kingdom, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. He, that is the Son, is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn, the preeminent one over all creation. For by Him, by the Son, all things were created. In the heavens, on the earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He's also head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven." And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Now, Lord willing, we will examine the details of the throne room in chapter 4 next week. Let me ask you this, Christian. What captures your attention? What grips you and draws you in and will not let your eyes depart? Listen, we struggle to get our hearts here. But one day, very soon, we will be undistractable. It's inevitable. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, our King, our Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Our Redeemer, our Master, our Sovereign, our Creator, You are the answer. You are everything. We need You. We need once again to have our hearts gripped by the reality of who You are, what You have accomplished, and what you will accomplish. You will resolve every difficulty, fix every hardship, clean up all residue of filth. You will set all things right. And how we long for that day. We echo the revelator and say, come Lord Jesus. 
It's in your name we pray and in your name we sing. Amen.